Good afternoon. Welcome to the 31st awarding of the McGraw Prize in Education. This celebrated award advances innovation in education by recognizing outstanding individuals whose accomplishments are making a difference today. Penn takes enormous pride that our Graduate School of Education, led by our great Dean Pam Grossman and the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Family Foundation are partnering to advance excellence in education through this prize. I am especially pleased to welcome members of the McGraw family, including Terry, a proud Wharton graduate, along with Sue and Bob. Your unwavering dedication to the future of education inspires us all. Since it was established in honor of Harold McGraw, Jr., the McGraw Prize has honored nearly a hundred extraordinary leaders. Each has played a transformative role in education. McGraw Prize winners are who's who of educational leadership today. They are great minds devoted to improving education through innovation. They're building a better future for us all by putting their evidence-based insights into practice. Penn GSE shares this essential commitment to serving our nation's youth, especially in this time of educational crisis. Today, the line between home and school has been blurred. Innovation in teaching and new methods of learning are more important than ever. Our commitment to students, to educational research, to putting best practices to work in this new reality will have a profound and lasting impact on our world. We honor we promote, and today we celebrate new ideas in education. We applaud teachers everywhere who share the common bond of inspiring others to learn and to grow. Excellence in education is the single most powerful force for understanding and for change. And so innovation in education must be our future. The McGraw Prize celebrates efforts to make lasting advancements for students across our nation and around the world. Three outstanding innovators will be awarded prizes tonight in pre-K to 12 education, in higher education, and in learning science research. Thanks to these innovators and their work, we can look forward to the future with hope. We will find answers to the most complex challenges of today. We will advance new ways of thinking, and we will meet the educational challenges of a global pandemic and emerge stronger for it. Thank you all, and my warmest congratulations to each of tonight's winners. Thank you, Dr. Gutman, and thank you for your outstanding leadership. My family is proud to have established a new and exciting partnership with the University of Pennsylvania to enhance and expand the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Prize in Education, one of the most prestigious honors in the field. In 1988, the Board of Directors of McGraw-Hill honored my father's service to the company and his lifelong commitment to education and literacy by creating the McGraw Prize. My dad was a special person, thoughtful, gracious, and modest. But when it came to the subject of education, he was a vocal and vigorous advocate. He believed deeply that society needed to celebrate the role of educators. He called it shining a spotlight. Education was in his blood. My great-grandfather, James H. McGraw, who founded McGraw Hill in 1888, was a school teacher and a principal in an upstate New York elementary school. At the core of McGraw Hill's founding was the notion that education and knowledge were central to the progress of our nation. My father expanded on James H. McGraw's philosophy and built the largest educational and professional publishing company in the world, established on the principles of quality and integrity. He understood that as our nation grew larger and more diverse, education held the key to growth and success. I was blessed with the opportunity to lead the McGraw Hill companies and to build upon my father's work with thousands of dedicated employees and colleagues. I was joined on the journey by my brother Bob, who before joining the McGraw-Hill board, spent many years running the international publishing operations for McGraw-Hill. And no one picked up the education mantle more passionately than my sister, Sue. She has been a teacher her entire professional life and has created groundbreaking programs to assist children 
with special needs. Today, we are thrilled to celebrate the next class of McGraw Prize winners. All have brought meaningful and lasting change to the fields of K-12 education, higher education, and learning science research. As Dr. Gutman noted, today's class joins 100 past winners who form a powerful family of innovators who continue to have a profound impact on education. Thanks to our partnership with Penn Graduate School of Education, we have created an expanded platform to recognize and celebrate the work of McGraw Prize winners. In so doing, we ensure that innovation, inspiration, and impact in education are recognized. What makes the prize especially powerful is that it is chosen by an independent panel of 12 judges who are leaders in the field, five of whom are former prize winners. I thank them all for their service and many contributions. They have again chosen a remarkable class of winners who have closed gaps, promoted equity, and advanced opportunity in education. And finally, thank you for joining us today. By holding this event virtually, we can share the remarkable work of this year's winners with the widest possible audience. We can also extend our gratitude to educators globally who are meeting the challenges posed by the coronavirus with selflessness and sacrifice. You represent the highest ideals of education. Thanks to all of you. Education is the first line of defense. If people aren't capable of growing, developing, doing things, making things happen, then there's just a huge void. This prize began as a recognition of what Harold W. McGraw Jr. was doing and how he lived his life in terms of the pursuit of innovation and creativity in the education space. This was a prize that was inaugurated when he was retiring, and his hope was to help new ideas be impactful to others, to meet people who would encourage and be exciting and motivating to others. That is the same spark that goes through the generations. We're thrilled to have the McGraw Prize housed now at Penn GSC. We think it's such a great fit with our mission and the mission of the prize. And we're so thankful to Terry, Bob, and Sue McGraw for trusting us with the legacy of their father and trusting us to carry on that vision. Innovation in the education space is much like what a lot of the award winners are about. It's about change and transformation and doing things differently, all with the eye on making impacts, impacts in other people's lives. If we want to boost student achievement, then innovation is the catalyst for new sets of results. Innovation is about always trying to improve the interactions between teachers, students, content, and increasing opportunity. Prize is the Nobel Prize of Education. One of the distinguishing characteristics of a McGraw Prize winner is that they think outside of the norm. They have a deep commitment to education and reaching all students. The McGraw Prize winner is someone who is respected by his or her peers, he is someone who has established a new normal for education. These are people who have really pushed the boundaries of educational thought. They've each tried to develop a new way of seeing the world of education and the opportunities. Recognizing all these wonderful men and women who have made such a difference in the education space, knowledge space, for the betterment of our own country, our own societies and communities. To anyone who is looking to make a difference, this realm of education, it is the place where we get to touch the future. 
purpose of education is to help kids become the fully empowered citizens of their local and global worlds so that they can be the change agents. This year was a new step in the prize's evolution. It's very exciting to be able to give the recognition through the prize in our partnership with Penn. It is crucial that as a family we support something that will take it to the next generation and then on to others because that's what it's all about. Hello. We are thrilled that you've joined us from your homes and offices around the world as we recognize this year's winners. My name is Michael Golden, and I am the Executive Director of Catalyst at Penn GSC, a senior fellow and proud to have earned my doctorate from Penn GSC. Catalyst is a center for global education innovation with the mission of connecting people and ideas to develop novel and meaningful ways to advance innovation in worldwide education. That's why we're thrilled to partner with the McGraw Family Foundation on this important prize to recognize these innovative educators. So far today, you've learned of the McGraw's extraordinary commitment to innovation in education and how important this award is to their family. You heard President Gutman stress the critical, urgent need for educators to harness innovation, to find lasting solutions in these unique and challenging times. And now you'll hear from Penn GSE Dean Pam Grossman as she shares her thoughts on this exciting partnership and what it means for the future of learners and educators worldwide. Dr. Pam Grossman has been Dean and the George and Diane Weiss Professor of Education at Penn GSE since 2015. Her recent scholarship focuses on practice-based teacher education, project-based learning, and teacher education and professional development. She is chair of the Spencer Foundation Board of Directors and a board member of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Under her leadership, Penn GSE has expanded its legacy of excellence as reaffirmed by our number two U.S. News and World Report ranking for graduate schools of education for the second consecutive year. Please join me in welcoming Dean Pam Grossman. Thank you, Michael, for that lovely introduction and for serving as our MC. Our program today marks a momentous occasion made possible by the contributions of so many people. I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of those who helped make this event possible. First, I want to thank Terry, Bob, and Sue McGraw, and the dedicated staff at the McGraw Family Foundation, including Eileen Gabriel and Glenn Goldberg. Thank you so much for your partnership and support. Thank you, President Gutman, for joining us in this celebration of education and innovation two endeavors close to your heart and to Penn's mission. I want to thank Michael Golden and the whole Catalyst team and all the numerous faculty and staff from across Penn GSE who worked so hard to support today's event. Thank you to the panel of judges for their careful reading and excellent judgment. And of course, we want to acknowledge and thank the prize founder, Harold McGraw, Jr., who had the initial vision of celebrating and recognizing the importance of educational innovation. Finally, thanks to our 2020 winners. Before we hear from them, I'd like to take a moment to mark this evening's celebration as a commitment to highlighting thought leadership creativity, and innovation among some of the greatest minds in education. In the McGraw Prize, Penn GSE has found both a kindred spirit and a powerful partner. And there has never been a more important time to combine our forces for good. The uncertainty and unrest that has defined much of 2020 continues to disrupt the educational landscape, illuminating devastating disparities, and bringing the challenges faced by learners, educators, families, and leaders to the forefront. As the line between school and home has blurred, parents have realized more than ever the complexity of teaching. 
and our current crises have increased the urgency for educators and leaders to find new and effective ways to support learning in different modalities and to bridge the digital divide. We're honored and humbled that when seeking a new partner to steward Harold McGraw's legacy and to grow his vision, the McGraws chose Penn GSE. McGraw Prize winners embody the cutting edge of educational leadership, and the more than 100 recipients to date are committed to making a profound difference in education and in the lives of so many young people. At Penn GSE, we too have a long and renowned legacy of leading in education. For more than a century, the school has been a prominent voice that has helped shape the conversation around educational opportunity and innovation, while helping to prepare the next generation of educators to meet the demands of the 21st century. Driven by its entrepreneurial spirit, Penn GSE is a school of firsts, the first school of education to launch an education business plan competition, the first master's program in education entrepreneurship, the first program for chief learning officers, and so much more. We're a community of bold thinkers and doers who dare to think outside of the box, pioneering new ways to incorporate computational thinking into teaching and learning, new pathways to a college degree, and new approaches to making sure that our youngest children are set up for success in school. I'm thrilled to congratulate the 2020 McGraw Prize winners, who throughout their careers have worked to create transformative educational opportunities for all learners, particularly those who have been underserved by society, and to welcome them into the McGraw and Penn GSE communities. Congratulations. As you can see, the McGraw Prize in Education has and will continue to impact the lives of so many. And we are thrilled to add three more visionary, transformational leaders to the esteemed list of McGraw Prize winners today. They were nominated alongside many others through an open process and selected through four rounds of judging, including the final round that included a dozen dynamic, innovative education leaders, some of whom are past winners from across the world. We are grateful to all of the individuals who dedicated their expertise and time to serve as judges. First, we'll hear from a winner who has devoted her career to equity in education, Dr. Estella Ben-Simon. The 2020 McGraw Prize winner for higher education, Estella is a professor of higher education at the University of Southern California's Rossier School of Education, and also the director of the Center for Urban Education, which she founded in 1999. With a singular focus on increasing racial equity and higher education outcomes for students of color, she developed the Equity Scorecard, a process for using inquiry to drive changes in institutional practice and culture. Since its founding, the center has worked with thousands of college professionals, from presidents to faculty to academic counselors, helping them take the steps in their daily work to reverse the impact of systemic disadvantages that prevent many students of color from excelling in higher education. Please welcome Dr. Estella Ben-Simon. Estella Ben-Simon is the very definition of a legend. There are very few people that you're going to find in the education space who are really driving educational equity the way Dr. Ben Simone does. The problem that I'm trying to solve is racial inequity, not just in terms of access, but in terms of outcomes and opportunities. She has tools that we can all use to create a better higher education system across the nation for all students. She is fearless, unapologetic. She was leading on equity when everyone else was still focused on diversity. Her equity scorecard process stimulated a paradigmatic shift in higher education as it inspired faculty and administrators to accept institutional responsibility for student success. My immigrant experience sensitized me to how do we create better environments for students to not feel marginalized and also to be able to recognize their knowledge and assets. 
I don't consider her in the lens of experts in higher education. I consider her as an expert at the national level about improving society. It's very admirable that this prize has been established because it's one of the very few that reward educators in such a dignified and respectful way that reinforces our work. Estella Ben Simone has absolutely earned the McGraw Prize for Education. When you're talking about innovation, leadership, making a difference, she has done that and so much more. And I just want to say congratulations. You deserve it, Estella. It is a great honor to be recognized with the McGraw Prize. I am very grateful to Terry McGraw and the McGraw family for their commitment to education and to innovative educators everywhere. When Terry called to let me know of my selection, I was speechless and surprised. Following the call, I looked over the list of past recipients all of whom have made tremendous and lasting contributions to education. It was hard to believe that I had been selected to join them. I don't say this in false modesty. I came to the United States at the age of 12. I left a town of 7,000 people that I thought to be paradise. Despite not having paved streets, traffic lights, or television, and having gone to a public school with no more than five classrooms. I was then thrust into a high school of a couple thousand students where my accent, as well as my foreignness, was ridiculed. Having experienced the alienation that comes from being different and then being witness to the emergence of the civil rights movement, I was deeply inspired to care about and work for racial justice. 20 years ago, after becoming a full professor at the University of Southern California, I founded the Center for Urban Education with a specific mission dedicated to racial equity in higher education. What made the work that I carried out under the umbrella of the Center for Urban Education unique is that we appended the focus on the achievement gap to focus instead on the failing performance of higher education for Blacks, Latinx, Native Americans, and marginalized Asian American groups. We shifted responsibility from the students to the institutions and practitioners. We pioneered methods of critical inquiry to help higher education practitioners and leaders see that practices that they believed to be racially neutral were in fact racialized and also the cause of the achievement gap they so lamented, but too often renounced as their responsibility. We taught practitioners and leaders to ask, why are we so much more successful with white students than we are with racially minoritized groups? Why is it that our practices fail to bring about success for students from groups that have been oppressed for several generations. The Center for Urban Education's footprint now is broad and deep. Over 20 years, our tools and methods have touched 678 institutions and university systems. More recently, our tools are helping philanthropic organizations examine their own funding practices through the lens of racial equity. With the strides that we have made, however, I want to acknowledge that in our current environment, we must redouble our efforts and resources to uphold racial equity as a matter of moral urgency and civic decency. During the last six months, we have experienced health, racial, and environmental crises we have suffered the loss of two formidable fighters for justice, John Lewis 
and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we face challenges from all sides in the midst of a contentious election season. All of these things are irrevocably changing our world, impacting our future in ways we cannot yet conceive. As we consider the future, I have seen a great deal written about returning to normal after we emerge from the current situation. But rather than yearning to get back to normal, we need to strive for a different kind of normal, a more just and equitable normal. We must redistribute wealth through a more progressive system of taxation. We need to go beyond the minimum wage to ensure a just income system and enact a system of truly universal health care. We need to make higher education affordable. We need to grant citizenship to undocumented students. And we need to place racial equity at the center of all of our plans. In recognizing me, the McGraw Family Foundation honors me tremendously and most importantly shows its support for the work that I have done and I am continuing to do. For me, the McGraw Prize represents a meaningful and significant recognition, one that I know, in my case, has been made possible by the generosity of mentors, colleagues, friends, and a very supportive husband. It has also been made possible by the richness of opportunities given to me by Montclair State University, and by Teachers College at Columbia University, Penn State University, where I began my academic career, and the University of Southern California, where I have spent the last 25 years. I am very, very grateful to these institutions and to the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education for helping to make this prize possible. An award of this magnitude serves to reaffirm my commitment to continue my fight to improve education. And I hope that others will join me in championing those students who most need our attention, innovation, and support. Thank you. Thank you, Estella, for your powerful remarks. Our next winner is Dr. Micheline Chi, this year's McGraw Prize winner in Learning Sciences Research. Mickey is the Dorothy Bray Endowed Professor of Science and Teaching and Director of the Learning and Cognition Lab at Arizona State University. A cognitive and learning researcher, Mickey has made numerous contributions to advance the field of learning sciences. Some notable highlights include building a framework for understanding active learning that differentiates students' overt engagement activities, developing an understanding of the power of self-explanation as a key way to learn, evolving our understanding of the way experts and non-experts think, and influencing how we think about learning in more interactive settings. And as you have surmised, Mickey's work has given us a better understanding of how to support every learner. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mickey Chi. I think the majority of my papers cite Mickey Chi. I mean, she has many articles that are citation classics. She's the international heartbeat of empirical learning science research. I try to understand how students learn first. And once you understand how students learn, you then determine how one might want to teach to get that kind of learning. Mickey's work has been very pioneering in helping children and adults learn how to comprehend difficult science concepts. And it's actually led to a revolution in science education. She has a theory that is unchallenged, a methodology which is flawless, and her results are impactful. You're creating future generations, which you hope are gonna be better than you. So in that sense, it's really optimistic. She is a confluence of stratospheric brilliance, a consummate teacher, scholar, mentor, and she has a gargantuan heart. The education field is the field that I came to later in life. So 
to be appreciated by the education community is really very special to me. I absolutely believe that Mickey is the perfect recipient of the McGraw Award in the learning sciences. I can't think of anybody more deserving. I'm deeply honored to be a recipient this year of the Harold W. McGraw Junior Prize in Education. I'm grateful for this recognition. I want to thank Terry McGraw for calling me to tell me the good news and President Amy Gutman and Dean Pam Grossman for planning and hosting the selection process at University of Pennsylvania. I also want to acknowledge my nominators, James G. and Ida Malian, for their time and support. This award is inspiring me to accelerate my current work on translating research into practice that I will briefly explain. Benjamin Franklin, appropriately the founder of University of Pennsylvania, long ago gave this wise by now familiar recommendation about teaching and learning that tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Although the quote has often been cited throughout these past roughly 250 years, teaching and learning has continued largely to involve telling, which can be interpreted as lecturing, which is the dominant mode of instruction in higher education and online education. One can interpret Franklin's second line about teaching as corresponding to K-12 teachers' telling ideas, followed by a quick assessment of students' understanding in an IRE type of questioning to confirm that student remembered it. IRE stands for questioning of the following sorts. A teacher asks an inquiry. How many chambers does the human heart have? The student responds, four. And the teacher gives an evaluation, good. So we can interpret Franklin's teaching as telling plus IRE sort of questioning for a quick confirmation. This kind of teaching does result in better remembering. However, it is time that we progress to the involve me part of Franklin's recommendation and perhaps beyond. What might involve me mean? Involve me has been translated in education work as active learning, meaning involve me in doing something without, but without defining what active learning or doing something mean, it turns out that teaching in every way but lecturing does show demonstrable benefits. A meta-analysis of 225 college science and math classes do confirm that anything but telling improves learning substantially more than telling, as well as increases retention and reduces achievement gap and so forth. The puzzle remains. Although active learning is more effective than telling, what does active learning involve? Are there different kinds of active learning? Are some kind more effective than other kinds? Intrigued by Franklin's quote, in the past decade, I have developed a theory of active learning that takes into account the thinking process of how students learn and map those thinking processes to possible student behavior. Why behavior? Because student behavior is something that a classroom teacher can observe. As a learning scientist, we must always think about the context of practice for our interventions and theories. By considering student behavior while learning, I arrived at four distinct types of student behaviors along with four discrete types of student products. Let me be specific. What I call the passive behaviors when students pay attention to instruction or instructional materials, but not producing anything overtly, such as listening to a lecture, watching a video, even reading a text, but not taking notes. What I call the active behavior is when students manipulate the learning materials in some way, such as underlining text sentence or copying from PowerPoint slides or clicking an icon from video. The key point of this behavior is that students are producing something, but the product does not add any new information to the instructional materials, just doing something with it. For example, the underlying sentence were already there in the text. What I call the constructive behavior is when students are generating something that results in a product or output that contains additional information that is not originally present in the instructional materials, such as posing a question, drawing a diagram, giving an explanation, even if incorrect, and so forth. The generator question, diagram, and the incorrect explanation were not in the material originally presented. The interactive behavior goes beyond Franklin's quote. 
Interactive refers to the behavior of students collaborating with each other to learn to solve problems. Again, substantial research in the learning sciences has confirmed that collaborative learning is superior to individual learning if students collaborate in the proper way. Based on the cognitive learning processes that I've conjectured for each of these four ways of behaving, the theory that I developed called ICAP predicts that the interactive way of behaving that is collaboratively leads to the highest level of learning and better than the constructive way of behaving that is generating, which in turn is better than the active way of behaving that is manipulating, followed last by the passive way of learning that is doing nothing, listening to a lecture, by paying attention. That is, learning decreases from I to C to A to P in the ICAP order. So now think about this. The passive behavior is paying attention, which often is the loftiest goal that teachers and instructors aim to achieve. But this results in the lowest level of learning. ICAP's predictions are supported by hundreds of published studies in the literature. When we map the conditions of an intervention in the study to ICAP behavior and see that the ICAP predictions are confirmed. Given that ICAP is defined in terms of visible student behavior and concrete student products, rather than in invisible thinking processes, ICAP can now be easily explained to teachers. And with the understanding of ICAP, teachers should be able to design activities for their own lesson plans that elicit higher ICAP levels of learning, such as asking questions that require an explanation rather than an IRE type of questions. Improving the lesson plans themselves will allow teachers to take ownership of them, as opposed to having some researchers tell them what to teach and what to do. Toward this goal of allowing teachers to revise the lesson plans themselves in a theory-driven and evidence-based way, we have developed a module that can be delivered online or in person that explains what ICAP is and how teachers and instructors can use ICAP to modify their lesson plans and improve their teaching. My colleagues and I hope to disseminate a module through professional and faculty development in the near future. The Harold McGraw Junior Prize in Education is encouraging me, and I hope others as well, to increasingly focus our efforts in understanding how students learn and use that knowledge to inform how teachers teach in a way that closes the research practice gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mickey, for your wonderful comments. And now to our final winner, Dr. Joseph Krejcik. Joe is the 2020 McGraw Prize winner in pre-K-12 education. Joe serves as the director of the Create for STEM Institute and is the Lappin Phillips Professor of Science Education at Michigan State University, a joint institute between the Colleges of Natural Science and Education at MSU, Create for STEM seeks to improve the teaching and learning of science and mathematics in K-16 education through innovation and research both in the U.S. and globally. Throughout his career, Joe has worked with science teachers to reform teaching practices that promote student engagement in and the learning of science through design, development, and testing of project-based learning environments. He also led the development of the Next Generation Science Standards and the framework on which they're based, leading to advancements in science education thinking and practices that have been adopted by teachers, districts, and states across the nation and impacted systems worldwide. These standards offer all students, even those in traditionally underserved areas, the access and opportunity to think like a scientist, work like a scientist, and most importantly, become a scientist. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joe Krejcik. The best science educator, researcher around, Joseph Krejcik. STEM education is at such an important juncture that we're going to actually solve the problems that exist in our world. Joe deserves the McGraw Prize because of the huge impact he has had on students, teachers, researchers across the world, all helping to see how students can be real scientists. Joe's work brings out science literacy for all students. It doesn't matter if they were struggling, if they're in low-income neighborhoods, 
Everyone seems to do better with the work that Joe has innovated. We're really trying to create environments to inspire young children to love and understand science. He has developed project-based learning for science. It's defined his life's work. Project-based learning is all about putting kids in situations where they come up with solutions to problems. And those problems have to be compelling and motivating to the learners. Once I started working with Joe, I saw that kids could do even more, asking their own questions, collecting their own data, leading what was going on in the classroom. Working with Joe changed the way I thought about teaching. I think it's amazing tribute to the McGraw family, and it certainly is inspirational that they really want to push innovations in education. Joe is our science innovator, both today and for the future. We have to inspire the next generation to move forward. Those children, they're the hope of the future. Good day. I'm honored to be here today to receive the Harold W. McGraw Junior Prize in Education that celebrates innovation in education. Helping all students develop deep knowledge is the only way to solve the pressing problems we are experiencing today. Wildfires in the Northwest, worldwide pandemic, lack of clean air for all, and social injustice and inequality, and many problems that students will experience throughout their adult lives. High quality and engaging education for all children throughout the globe is a necessity and a right if we hope to have a just and sustainable society. By deep knowledge, I mean individuals who can use their knowledge to make sense of the problems and reoccurring natural events that they experience. But knowledge is more than just learning the facts. It is knowing how to use the big disciplinary ideas of science and then applying them using the practices that scientists use in their daily work. These practices include asking questions, supporting claims with evidence, and constructing models based on evidence. But using knowledge also includes ideas that cut across the disciplines. These ideas include knowing how to find patterns, looking for cause and effect relationships, and considering how structure impacts function. When scientists seek solutions to novel and challenging questions, they need to apply all three forms of knowledge. And if we hope for learners to develop the deep, usable knowledge that they need to solve the problems of this world, we are also going to have to put them into situations where they experience challenging and complex problems that are compelling to them that they want to solve. And we have to put them in these situations so they can actually apply all three forms of these knowledges. However, I'm sure this form of instruction is very different than what you experienced. It's not typically what happens in K-12 science education. And it's very challenging form of instruction. Throughout my professional life, I have been driven by a passion to work with teachers, other educators, and science education researchers to create and explore these types of learning environments that really will engage children, K through 12, by having them try to figure out how to solve some complex problems. And in so doing, they will develop deep, usable knowledge and the motivation to continue to learn throughout their lives. I'm dedicated to igniting the joy and desire to learn in all students in order for everyone throughout the world to live in a knowledgeable, peaceful, just, and sustainable world. I started my career a long time ago as a high school chemistry and physics science teacher. And even back then, my drive was to engage learners in the doing of science, where they actually would use big ideas, engage in figuring things out about the world in which they lived. It's not just about learning the facts. Throughout my career, I've explored and advanced to use a project-based learning, a teaching and learning approach that aligns with engaging all learners in the actual doing of science. This matches actually the vision of the framework for K-12 science education that has come out of our National Academy of Science. And it is now the focus of science education throughout our nation. 
to develop learning environments in which students are driven to learn and make sense of challenging problems and events that reoccur in our world is the focus of the Research Institute I oversee at Michigan State University, the Create for STEM Institute. Crate's mission is to improve the teaching and learning of STEM through innovation and research. Create stands for Collaborative Research for Education, Assessment, and Teaching Environments. Collaboration is at the forefront because if we are going to make the lasting changes that are necessary in education, to bring about the changes that are necessary in our society, collaborations among teachers, researchers, and administrator is imperative. Solving challenging problems in any field of endeavor requires collaborations among individuals, and the same is true in education. I could not have engaged in the many research projects that I have throughout my career and been successful in them without the amazing collaborations I have had with teachers, graduate students, postdocs, and researchers, both in the US and around the world. I can't begin to name all of them. There are too many of them. But without them, many of the problems that we have begun to solve would not have occurred. These collaborations have allowed me to lead the development and the study of project-based learning environments in which students use scientific and engineering practices with the big ideas of science to make sense of the world in which they live. But perhaps even more importantly, to inspire a sense of wonderment and joy about the world, because this is what's gonna drive them to continue to wanna learn. When learners engage in making sense of reoccurring natural events, they come to see themselves as knowledgeable participants in the increasingly STEM-influenced society, and it drives them to want to learn. I do want to take a few minutes to recognize a few individuals who have influenced and encouraged me in my work. Most importantly, Anne, my wife of 40 years, who supported me and encouraged me throughout my career, from being a high school teacher, to making the shift to attend graduate school, to the many years of working as a science education researcher and professor. Without her consistent love and support, I just wouldn't be here today and wouldn't be the individual I am. Anne is also a dedicated middle school science teacher. And because she is, she's been one of my collaborators. How fortunate am I to work with someone who also wants to change the way we go about doing education. I also wanna thank my three children, Michael, Paul, and Ellen, and their children, who consistently bring me joy and a desire to continue to prove as an individual. I want to recognize my mother, because without her unconditional love, I truly don't know where I would be today. And I want to mention my first mentor, Charlie Rossiter, who has become a lifelong friend. I wasn't really a great K-12 student. In fact, I barely got into university after attending community college. And I can certainly tell you this, I wasn't a good writer. My first year at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, I took a class with Charlie and he transformed my life because he helped me realize I could learn. And more importantly, not only could I learn, but I could contribute. Charlie's support launched me on the pathway as a learner who could contribute to the world. What a powerful realization for a young learner. I relay this personal story only because if we hope to support all children in learning and reaching their potential, teachers need to encourage them. Without that encouragement, we will not get the changes we need in this world because all learners will not see themselves as I can do this. Children of any age need our love, our support, and encouragement to help guide them in their pursuit of knowledge. I want to close by giving a heartfelt thank you to the individual who nominated me, the committee that selected me, and the McGraw Foundation. I was truly surprised when I got a call from Harold McGraw. I'm honored to receive this recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for those inspiring words. And thanks to you and Estella and to Mickey for joining us in this celebration. It's been my pleasure to introduce you to the 2020 Harold W. McGraw Jr. Prize in Education winners. 
We are also excited to announce our expanding set of programs and events with the McGraw Family Foundation. We will launch year two in our series of webinars with past McGraw Prize winners. We are scheduling a conversation with this year's three winners in February. In spring, we're organizing a symposium on how innovations flourish with Penn GSE faculty, McGraw Prize winners, some of our distinguished education leaders who serve as judges for the prizes, and more. And we're developing a brand new program we're super excited about. So stay tuned and stay in touch. Now I'll turn it back to Dean Grossman with some closing remarks. Thank you, Estella, Mickey, and Joe for sharing your journeys with us today. Your passion, commitment, and tenacity will inspire future generations to join in the important work of education. As we consider how we can use the momentum of this moment to achieve real and lasting change, support for individuals and ideas that champion educational equity and innovation is critical. We look forward to seeing how our burgeoning partnership evolves and how together we can work to expand the promise of education by forging a future that brings opportunity to children, families, and communities, no matter where they are across the globe. Mm -hmm.